So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to BioStrategy Partners Practical Knowledge Series. Today, we're going to be discussing what is your exit strategy, because it is never too early to begin formulating a plan. I would first like to give you a little background about BioStrategy Partners. We are a 501c3 nonprofit consortium of academic medical centers and research institutes. We are committed to the development and transfer of academic research to the marketplace. We do this by fostering industry academic collaborations and also providing education to faculty and graduate students about the commercialization and the tech transfer process. Before I turn you over to your moderator for today, I would first like to thank our sponsors, MVM Associates that provide all of your tax credit needs, Caesar Reviews who specialize in intellectual property law, and University Place Associates providing Class A commercial lab and office space. And I would now like to turn you over to your moderator, Michelle Washko. Michelle? Thank you, Erica. So I'm Michelle Washko. I'm the Executive Director of BioStrategy Partners. And I'm very pleased to have a couple of great panelists um, to talk to you today about planning for your exit strategy, or planning your exit strategy, rather. Um, a little bit about myself, and then I'll ask John and Andy to introduce themselves in turn. So in addition to serving as executive director of BioStrategy Partners, I serve as COO of Respona Therapeutics, and that's an association I share with one of your panelists here, Andy Agrawal. I also um, have a small consulting firm that specializes in commercial scale-up of life sciences technologies called Life Science Innovations. So I will be participating in addition to guiding today's um, conversation. Um, and with that, um, let's turn it over to John for his introduction. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm John Pennant. I'm the partner in charge of the life sciences practice at Eisner Amper. Eisner Amper is a full service accounting and consulting firm uh, providing audit, uh, tax, outsourced accounting services. Uh, I've been doing this for about 35 years. Um, so hopefully I can get out in a few more years with good behavior if I'm lucky. Um, uh, but uh, I've always enjoyed working in particular with entrepreneurs. So our, our client base includes you know, startup companies all the way through public companies, but I've always kind of enjoyed the entrepreneurial spirit and uh, the entrepreneurial support system. So I enjoy that side of the practice. Um, I'm also a member of the Mid-Atlantic BioAngels uh, Angel Network, which is uh, headquartered in New York, although there's quite a lot of members from the uh, Philadelphia through Boston corridor. Thank you, John. Andy, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, for including me. Uh, I'm happy to be here. So I have been for the last 20 years in the uh, mergers and acquisitions business. Um, I'm part of a small firm based here in Charlotte, North Carolina. And our main focus is typically sell side representation, where we have technology companies, software companies, healthcare companies that are looking to be acquired. Uh, and we are the, the, the group that facilitates that. So over the past 20 years, I've closed uh, somewhere between 45 and 50 transactions, uh, both U.S. and Canada companies. Uh, prior to that, I've been involved in operations and management in public health care companies, startups, uh, and everything in between. So I've been pretty active. I've done some angel investing myself. So hopefully, uh, you know, I'll have a perspective that kind of uh, all sides of the table to share. Thanks, Michelle. Sure, that's wonderful. Thank you, Andy. And thank you, John. Um, before we really get into a discussion in earnest, I thought it might uh, be helpful to just level set and sort of loosely define what an exit is. What do we mean by that? And um, for those of you in the audience who might not be aware, when we talk about an exit, we're talking about how it is that someone who is involved in a firm um, essentially becomes disinvolved. How is it that they get a return on their investment of time or money or both? Um, so it, while a corporation can exist indefinitely, um, uh, usually the people who become involved in a corporation, particularly in a startup, don't necessarily intend to stay forever. Um, they want to get a return on their investment. But that's not entirely true in all instances. There is something that we call a lifestyle business. And what we mean by that is a business that is generally designed to provide employment for a founder or a small group of founders or small group of employees. And the idea there is that the company may well wind down with um, the retirement or the passing of the founders or perhaps pass on to a family member, for example, or employees via an ESOP. But that's not the kind of company we're talking about today. 
The kind of company that we're talking about today is one that is um, designed from the beginning with the intent of growing and then ultimately being acquired or sold. So we're going to talk today about um, how to begin thinking about that end game, if you will. And I'd like to start at the very beginning. Um, a lot of the folks in our audience will be, have um, either not started a company yet or may have formed an LLC, but not really done much more than that. And so what I'd like to do is begin with you, Andy. Could you talk um, from your perspective, um, knowing that you have a legal background in addition to your um, deep uh, investment expertise, could you talk about the way one should think about forming a company from the very beginnings to facilitate an exit? Uh, sure, sure. So there are a few options in mind. I guess I would say, you know, just to use some terminology, there's a corporation structure, there's something called a limited liability company or LLC, I'm sure everyone's familiar with, and there's something called a partnership. The starting point generally is you want to create an entity that that's tax efficient. So for example, a traditional corporation, a corporation that generates revenues, pays corporate tax, and then when the corporation tries to pass down to the, the shareholders uh, dividends, those get taxed a second time. So there are various structures to avoid this double tax. And, and the typical ones are either an S corporation, which is basically not taxed. It's uh, the tax passes through to the owners or an LLC. So let's just focus on those two as the best choices. Um, I think either one of them works. My personal preference is to use an S corporation status. If, you're, if your intention is to build a company that's going to seek investment, and then ultimately is going to try to attract uh, talented team members, whether they're scientific or business. The convenient thing with an S corporation is you can set up a stock option plan. I assume everybody's familiar with stock options. Uh, they're generally well known and, and they're nice. It's a nice, simple way to uh, incent and bring aboard people when you don't have a lot of cash. Um, with an LLC, it's a little bit more complicated. It, there's, there's no stock in an LLC. So my personal preference tends to be with an S corporation. So, uh, you know, John or Michelle, please feel free to chime in or add or disagree. Yeah, so I think um, uh, one of the things that you think about is with a, with an LLC or an S corporation, you also, at the very beginning of the company, you get to take advantage of the losses that the company is generating. So if you put in, you know, $5,000 and the company loses $5,000, if you have a flow through entity, you're, you're able to take that loss on your personal tax return, which is a really terrific advantage. Um, so I think that's a very positive aspect at the very, very beginning of the company. Um, one of the other considerations to think about, uh, which we've seen quite a bit across our, our practice group, is the consideration of the qualified small business stock exemptions. So there's an exclusion and you'll, you'll hear the qualified small business exemption or you'll hear section 1202 to be tax code geeky for a second. Um, and what that means is that if you sell a corporate stock as a founder in particular, um, you're able to exclude up to $10 million, you know, loosely, loosely speaking of the capital gains that results from that. So if the, if the objective is to create a company that's got some really good opportunities for an exit transaction and, and you think you're gonna to have to hold it for five years to, to realize that, that's a really strong consideration to think about as well. Um, that's a little longer view than the shorter view of doing a pass through and getting the instant deductions for that and then perhaps the cash back. Um, the other thing to think about real quick would be, you know, there are different R&D type credits and incentive programs available for corporations versus flow through entities. So you also weigh that aspect of it as well. So, so you just ask, ask some questions, ask your attorneys, ask your accountants uh, about which item would be the best fit for, for you. Great, thank you. Great. Are there other considerations other than the, the, stru the structure, the C Corp or S Corp or LLC that one should be thinking about early on in the startup phase? Well, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll chime in first and then John should jump in. So one thought I have, and I've got some, I've got an example to share. If you are, have a group of folks who will say, okay, we think we've got something really cool. We've got some great science. We've got some intellectual property. Let's create a company. One of the initial things to think about is how do you divide up the equity? And, you know, I think the natural tendency if there's two people is to say, hey, let's set up a 50-50 ownership. And I would suggest to you that the ownership at the time you found a company, if you have a group of founders, should really 
track the contributions those founders have made to whatever you're going to put into the company. Um, and I, I, you know, basically what you need to think about when you form the company, the, the contributions, whether it's, you know, brain power, you know, sweat equity, money, really should define how much equity you get. And then from that point forward, when you bring on new people, you typically reward them with stock options that incense them to add to the value that you've already created. And I've, I've been involved uh, years ago with the, the local university, the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. I worked pretty regularly with the tech transfer office and a lot of the grad students and, and professors that were looking to spin out uh, companies. And there were at least several instances where, again, it was typically two people created a company. It was 50-50. And in both cases, one person had been really the driving force and in, in com- starting to look for a way to commercialize you know, 20 years of research. And the second person was more viewed as, you know, the person that was going to get the company off the ground. And in both cases, once the company started to show some traction, the founder started to realize, hey, I, I gave my partner 50 percent of value that really I created. So I think you have to try to take those considerations into account. And the conversations can be a little bit uncomfortable. But if you're not willing to have uncomfortable conversations at this stage, it's probably going to, you know, predict future challenges coming down the road. So I think you want to set the stage right at the beginning. Yeah, I think that that's great advice, Andy. Um, So I had gone through a series of three depositions over a five year period uh, when one of my clients had promised, allegedly, um, some ownership to a, a person who was a contributor at the very beginning of the company. Um, there was no documentation to support that. Uh, eventually, the company became successful after a long and arduous uh, path, and ultimately, the company was sold for sixty-six million dollars. And this uh, this person um, was trying to get his share. He said he was promised ten percent of the company at the very beginning. There was no documentation to prove it, so it really became a you know he said he said he said um, question. And so, unfortunately, I, as the as the accountant for the company at the time, said, "Well, what do you know?" And of course, you know, there was there was nothing to know because I was not party to the conversations or never any paperwork documented. Um, so that process cost them, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees, and ultimately there was a settlement. So the message really is: um, decide what you want to do. So to follow Andy's advice there, decide what you want to do, be fair about it, and document it at the very very beginning. Um, if you go back and try to document these things later, you also may be tripping up on some tax issues. So, you know, if you have people who are in your founders group, get them on board early, paper it properly, um, and make sure that's you know secured in in your in your uh, uh, your Dropbox or whatever system you're using to store your documents and keep that for in perpetuity. Great yeah, advice. Would, Sorry, please, go ahead, please. Oh, well, um, actually, I'm gonna. Um, Follow on this topic of stock options. I think there is um, a tendency among startups often to um, be, uh, give pretty freely sometimes of stock options because it feels um, uh, like it's not real, right? That it's not going to be real money. But I um, have heard that some uh, sort of general rule of thumb is um, one dollar in stock options is can be worth about five dollars um, sort of at the exit stage. So I want to give any thoughts on that. Whether that kind of ratio sounds true to you, and any kind of guidance about. Who should get stock options? Uh, employees, vendors? Um, should the guy who gets you develops your website get stock options? Anything along those lines you'd like to share? John, you want to go first? I've done taking the last two. Sure, sure. So I think what you want to do is to have a target in mind as to how much um, available stock options as a percentage of the total capital that you want to be able to give away. So, you know, we all appreciate that there may not be a lot of cash at the very beginning of the company. So stock options are a great way to um, incentivize people that you need to help uh, to be part of the team, uh, you know, have advisors, uh, professional service providers of various uh, types, et cetera, et cetera. Um, You may also have, um, you know, to give some options or warrants or some sort of equity to the university if you pull Um, the technology out of a university, but you should have a target in mind. So when you get to the venture capital stage, you know, you'll often see that, uh, you know, especially a later stage company, you'll see that there's an option pool of, you know, 8, 10, 12, maybe 15 percent 
as sort of a rule of thumb. Harder to do that at the very beginning because there's less, less shares and less people, um, but you should have a target in mind when you start that process. And again, paper it very early. Um, one of the things you do need to have an idea when you do give a stock option or, or if you give people shares is what's the value of those shares. Um, and that does cause a tax ramification. So you do have to have you know, some sort of documentation. And I think we'll talk about that a little bit later on uh, as to how you come up with some valuation um, for those options. So uh, that would be sort of a, a general rule of thumb that I would say. Andy? Sure. So that was good. I, I agree with all that. I, I guess taking it from the other perspective, from if I'm a founder. So I when I first got involved in sort of entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial companies, it was really late 90s, uh, I don't know how old everybody is on the call, but that was sort of the, the dot-com bubble blowing up. And back then, having been the recipient of stock options in multiple companies, we used to think every stock option was gonna be worth 10 bucks when the company goes public. So if I got 10,000 options in my head, that was $100,000. And back then I never said, okay, it's 10,000 options, but the company has 10 billion shares. So maybe that math isn't great, but that was the way you, people used to think about it which made it a nice way to bring people on board to say, oh, I'll give you options on 10,000 shares. And they'd be thinking, wow, that's a lot of money. So I, I, to Michelle, to your initial question, one to five bucks, I, I think that's all a myth. It all depends. There's so many factors that drive what that one option you get today is going to be worth five or $10 down, five or 10 years down the road. I've got a bunch of stock uh, lining bird cages that sounded great. So I, I would say, you, if you're going into founding a company that you intend to exit, it's not a lifestyle company, I would be saying you should be viewing the, your equity, which is your founder shares and your stock options as gold. So don't give it away to a vendor, to you know the person that does your copy machine, even to lawyers and accountants. I would be cautious about handing that out. If you don't have enough cash to do some basic things, you might not be ready to start the company yet. Um, so I agree, I think you have to set aside some percentage for stock options. And we're talking 10 or 20%, maybe 30% in the extreme before outside money comes in. So I, I think you should be guarding that equity, the options uh, cautiously and, and dole it out to people who really can make it an impact on your business growing it as opposed to, again, some vendor that you just need to work done. Yeah, I, I kind of think of saving those options for people who you really want to participate in the upside. So your photocopier vendor or you know the, the person who's doing your website is probably not somebody who you feel like needs to be part of your upside. They're just a vendor who needs to get paid. So um, and and keeping in mind that you know there are there are cheaper forms of capital than than equity. So you know if you can use some of your bootstrap type money and, and friends and family type money to cover those types of costs, it's gonna be less expensive in the long run than giving away an option. Great advice. Um, on the topic of friends and family money, I'm not entirely sure that everyone in the audience will know what that is. Um, would you like to talk about that for just a moment, please, Sean? Sure, so um, at the very beginning of companies, a lot of times you know, you'll go to you know, your, your rich, rich Uncle Joe and ask him to you know, help you with financing the company. And you'll explain the business uh, purpose um, that you're trying to do, your, your business thesis. And you know, Rich Uncle Joe's got the funds and wants to help, help you out there. So he gives you, uh, he gives you some sort of capital there. So that could be a friends and family financing. Um, there's a couple things that kind of are unique about those. Um, you know, the terms can be, generally speaking, whatever they want to be because it's a very closely held group. Um, and, and typically, you know, the, those if it's a if it's a promissory note, they can be extended. You know, the interest can be very favorable, et cetera. Um, one one area of caution again is to make sure that you do document um, what that instrument is. So, is it debt? Is it equity? Um, and then also to try to be fair, right? So, one of the things that we do see happen probably more than we'd like, and I'm sure Andy can speak to this as well, is we'll see that there's a, a friends and family round where you know, the family is purchasing shares, assuming that the company is worth, you know, $10 million, uh, but, but it's really only worth one or two. So then when you try to go get some real financing uh, from a, a real outside party, and then you have to tell the friends and family, well, you're not going to own 10% anymore. We're going to have to slice you down to 2% uh, for the same money you've already put in to kind of balance out the cap table. Um, that 
causes some just some unpleasantries amongst the family. So it's always a little dangerous, uh, of course, to be you know dealing with you know money and family, and not all things always work well in the technology space, as we know. So there has to be a you know there has to be clear awareness that there could be a, a total a total loss here, and make sure that you know Uncle Joe is prepared that you know this may not work, and you know make sure that that's not going to cause any um, you know ill will at the Thanksgiving table if this investment just doesn't pan out the way you hope or it takes you know, years or decades for it to pan out. Right, and um, I think it's worth remembering too that for friends and family money, you actually need not necessarily be a high net worth individual by definition, by legal definition, which is different from angel investors, right? Angels being sort of the money that often follows friends and family money, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, Andy, would, you I talked would... about, sorry, please, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say one, one, a couple things to think about. So I I agree with everything uh, John said. You know, from part of what I would suggest, just from my own experience, when you're taking friends and family money, presumably they're giving you the money not because they've done an evaluation of the science or the business prospects, because they're they're trusting in you or the founders. So it's a personal thing. I would highly recommend you caution whoever's giving you money to make sure they're giving you money they don't need, because again, it's about as high risk as you ever get. Um, so I think that's important to make sure they know that. It's also important that you're really cautious about making some promises. Hey, you know, give me 10 grand and I'll turn it into a million dollars. I would caution them to say, hey, you're betting on me. Thank you. You know, assume this is like a lottery ticket because that's really what it's like. The other thing I think, and again, I, I've talked to folks uh, here at UNC Charlotte about this. Remember, once you take outside money, you should view that you're a fiduciary of that person's money, even if it's your brother-in-law's, your wife's, what, whatever it is, that you, it's not your company anymore. I think this is so important. I've worked with so many venture capital funded companies where the business hasn't gone great and the founders are saying, hey, you know, we need more money from our venture guys, from our investors. They don't want to put money in or if they want to make it painful for me. You know, they're going to cram the value down. They're going to do things that hurt me as the founder. I, I think the flip side of that is you got to understand as a founder, you take someone else's money, it is no longer your company. Um, you know, the fact that your kid has a sporting event or, a, you know, a dance recital or whatever. And again, these have all been things personal to me. At three o'clock on Friday, you can't leave and go to those because you have somebody else's money. So you have to treat your, your, your company as a steward of that money. And I think it's an important distinction um, and one that everybody has to be cognizant of before starting to ask for somebody for their money. Sorry, Michelle, go ahead. Oh, no, please. Um, I'm going to uh, actually continue on something you just said there, um, because both of you have mentioned this idea of value or valuation a couple of times, and now might be a good time to explore that topic a little bit. I appreciate this could be a, an entire uh, course, college course on valuation, but maybe we could just sort of um, talk a little bit about what we talk, what we mean when we talk about valuation of a company um, and how we start to get at the value of a company. Um, and I will lay some groundwork here and say that very often in my experience, scientific founders feel like the value of the company is the equal to the number of grant dollars that have been awarded to them, uh, a, a young company that they founded, for example. And um, those of us who've been in this business for a while understand that that is um, typically not true. So let's explore that a little bit. And um, uh, maybe we'll start with you, John, and then um, Andy, please jump in as, uh, as you see fit. Sure. Yep. So when a company gets to be a little bit more mature um, and they're going to do a valuation, you know, there are three three things that we look at when we do a evaluation as a professional uh, delivered product. So we look at discounted cash flows. So that's one of the items that we look at. So at the very, very early stage, you know, whatever information you have about your, your expected revenues and what the cost of those revenues are going to be and even even how long it's going to take you to get the regulatory approval is pretty well you know hard to define and certainly from you know looking at it, anybody looking at that is going to put very very large discounts on that just because of the great unknowns so that's a technique but 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 one that's you know at the very early stage of companies not one that's going to give you a whole lot of comfort um, the second is sort of comparable companies and this for early stage companies tends to be where you probably wind up more often than not. 
is, you know, for a company that you know hasn't identified a lead yet, um, maybe hasn't gone through talk studies yet, whatever the particular status status may be, you know, there are general bands of of valuation that companies fall into. They're comparable companies that have gone through an exit at that stage. So you can say, you know, as a rule of thumb, you can fall somewhere in in that band. Um, and then the third the third technique that we use is 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 predicate transactions so have you actually raised money ideally from a third party and not from uncle joe or one of your other family members um, and that gives us some idea of what ideally a qualified person who's done some diligence you know thinks that the value of the company is um, so again at the early stage you don't typically find that or you don't typically find that there are independent uh, investors in the company um, so th those are usually hard to do so, so, so what we wind up typically doing is leaning more towards that valuation bands, uh, kind of based upon where you are, you know, what, the, what, what scientific area you are in, how far along you are in the development cycle, and things like that. Um, so that tends to be, you know, the technique that we probably use most frequently, you know, to kind of set up that valuation. Um, when we see discounted cash flow models. And you know everybody always winds up with $100 million in sales in five years, because um, that's sort of legit, just what I guess they teach you that in business school or something like that. Um, you almost always discount that as probably not really being very substantive. Um, and if you do prepare something like that, you should pre prepare it with enough depth and support to say, you know, here's my assumption, so you understand what your total addressable market is, what you think you could you could attack. Again, very, very difficult at the very beginning of the company, but if you're gonna do it, then do it correctly and build in your assumptions. So that's kind of, I guess, maybe a little bit of a background, I guess, in terms of some of the value valuation techniques that you could use in a process like this. Yeah, I, I would, uh, my perspective on that is valuation for an early stage company is largely irrelevant other than, first of all, it's relevant only in the context of what's the how much how many shares do i give out if money's coming in whether i'm selling it or taking an investment but until you get to that point it's really irrelevant it's it's, it's i agree with the you know what john described the traditional means of doing the valuation the reality is it's virtually impossible it's more of a wet finger in the air yeah i think i'm worth a million or three million or five million but it typically in the life cycle of a company where an exit strategy is relevant most of the time you're going to end up raising capital from outside investors who you don't know. So these independent investors are going to determine the value. Uh, many times I've seen early stage companies that have sought advice to say, okay, I'm, I'm looking to talk to you know, these 20 VCs, what value should I put on the company? And I've always told them, don't put a value on the company. It, what, you, what value you put on it, number one, is irrelevant to the investor. Two, if you put too big of a value on it, you're going to have some percentage of them that aren't going to take your call because they think you're unrealistic. And ultimately, the better thing is focus on pitching the investor on why they should invest. And then they're going to come up with a valuation. And then you, you might have an opportunity to negotiate it. You might might not. But I would also tell you, back to the, the dot-com days, I've learned that having a really, really, really small percentage of a company that's successful could be worth a whole heck of a lot more than having 20 or 30 or 100 percent of something that isn't. So my strong advice to founders who are going to look to take outside money is, don't get hung up on valuation, get hung up on bringing in outside money and ideally outside money that can help you. And then the pie is going to get bigger and it won't matter. Yeah. And we're, we're, all, we're sometimes asked by early stage companies if we can do a formal valuation and provide a written report that they can give to venture capitalists. And I, I always tell them, no, I mean, we, we can do it, but it's not worth the, it's not worth the paper it's written on and it's not worth the money that they're willing to spend. So I decline that and, and kind of give them that same advice. Um, and one of the areas that that you know, we see most often in early stage uh, companies in the investment side of it is, you know, we just don't know what the valuation is. So as an investor and the company, we're just not sure or we can't really agree upon it. So we see the valuation issue pushed down the road by the investment dollars coming in through either a convertible note or a safe instrument. So. Michelle, I don't know if you want if if you want to go through those a little bit in terms of what they are and why that pushes the valuation question down the I road. Think, I think that's a great idea because uh, early stage companies that's a, certainly most likely the 
first, one among the first investment vehicles they're going to see. So yes, please describe those for us. Right. So so a convertible note is is a promissory note. It has a it has a due date and it is debt that has to be repaid. But the preferred outcome is that it's going to convert into common stock or or preferred stock down the road. Uh, but, but but because we don't know what the value of the company is, it's hard to do an equity priced round, which would be to to use like Andy's example, the company's worth three or five million dollars. We're not sure what it's worth. So instead, what the what these promissory notes will typically say, and a safe note is is sort of some something similar, is it says we're going to put some money in today, but when you do a priced round down the road, we will convert into that financing instrument. So if it's a series A preferred uh, share at a dollar a share, we'll convert into that same series A instrument. However, because we're the early investor and we're taking a higher degree of risk, we would like to get a little bit of a discount. So if this, if the outside money eventually coming in for the series A is at a dollar a share, you know, I would like to get that at a typically you know, 20% discount. From that price, so that's going to recognize that I've taken an early risk, um, and my capital is at higher degree of risk than their capital because when they're coming in and giving you that dollar priced round, it's probably because a number of risks have been um, alleviated from the company, and there's better ability to come up with a true valuation. So that that topic just pushes the valuation question down the road. Uh, until they get to that price round. Was that was that clear enough? I think so, yes, yes. Andy, did you have anything to add yeah, there? Well, just, one, one, just one footnote to that. I, so I, I agree, I think the, the debt structure John described is the right way to go. It, it just puts the whole valuation question aside. The reality is, and he's, John's right, again, in all my experience, anybody who puts in the money early in one of those types of instruments John described, usually will expect a discount because their money is riskier. So to use that example, if I'm the venture capitalist and John put in hundred grand and, and expects a 20% discount on the million dollars I'm about to put in, I'll probably say, no, you know, we're all gonna be on the same page. It's all a negotiation. And what you have to keep in mind is whatever agreements are in place at the time you take venture money, the venture guys, at least in my experience, are more likely than not to say, here's what the terms are if you want our money. And even if previously people are say, entitled to a discount, the venture guys can easily say, no, we're all going in at the same point. That's generally been my experience in dealing with VCs, but that certainly isn't always the case. Yep. Yeah. And, and sometimes, you know, when you have, um, so, so I'll give you an example of a, a friends and family financing that I was a party to uh, a couple of years ago for one of my clients. Um, so it was described to me by the, by the founder as a as a preferred equity raise it was about five million dollars in total so it was fairly significant and so um you know he'd raised this money equity is going to be able to fund their their next stage of their development which was great so when we looked at the deal and and so he did this sort of kind of you know with a i'll, I'll say an in-house legal review um and the the family member um, you know, basically dictated the terms and he signed the document and he didn't understand what he what he signed. So what it was, was it was a preferred instrument, which was true, and it was convertible into common shares. But also, he also had to pay the $5 million back. So he had to pay $5 million of cash back and give him $5 million worth of stock. So it, was, it wasn't it wasn't an or, it was an and. And he said, well, that's not fair. I was like, well, probably not, but that's what you signed. So, you know, making sure you understand the terms of these agreements. Uh, sometimes, you know, family members may put in some terms either knowingly or unknowingly, which kind of handcuff you. So in that case, you know, ultimately, when the new investors came in after his money, they basically forced that uh, family member to accept something far less than his document said he was going to get. So that anecdote brings up a good question. How does someone, an early stage entrepreneur, find well-qualified people to help? So life sciences are often, um, in many respects, a little bit different than other kinds of businesses. For example, you know, a coffee shop or something or a restaurant or something of that nature. 
how does uh, an entrepreneur, a potential entrepreneur, find the right people to help advise him or her in the beginning? Uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll take a stab at the, that first. I, I think, you know, there's no perfect answer. I think the starting place is you work, work your network um, and find out, ideally, people in your, trusted people in your network who have worked with advisors or other companies that have followed the path you want to follow and then say, okay, I'd love my company to follow that path. Let's find out who that company that, you know, that's my example, uh, who they worked with. So I think that's a starting point. You know, you certainly don't want to do it just by a Google search. And I think the the level of checking, you know, the bona fides of the company, people who can vouch for them uh, are critical. If for some reason you just don't have a network where they have those kind of connections, then I think, you know, a law firm or an accounting firm is certainly going to have had lots of experiences with people, um, whether they're, you know, business coaches, investment bankers, people who are going to raise money venture capitalists, I think you go to the service providers um, that would be easier to get to if you don't have the network of business people. Um, and ultimately, once you've identified a person or persons, you just need to spend some time talking to them. And everybody can show you a PowerPoint deck saying, hey, here's all the things I can do. But number one, you got to make sure you feel comfortable working with them. There's got to be some good chemistry. And then talk to people that have worked with that particular advisor um, and, and you know do some homework. And certain, some of these kind of advisor roles are so critical to your success. Um, you know, don't don't take a shortcut on diligence. You know, make sure you check them out. Yeah. Can you I give an that, example, maybe? I'm sorry. Go ahead. That'd be Please, John. Please. I was just going to say maybe um, one or both of you could give examples of the kinds of questions you might ask uh, potential advisors when you're interviewing them. Well, I think the starting point is to figure out, okay, one, as an advisor, you know, what, give me some examples of people you've worked with that look like me, and look like me could mean a life science company, too. It could mean an early stage company. It could mean a founder who's never, you know, been in a traditional business role or somebody who's never had an exit. I think it's just a conversation to get a sense, you know, if you, if you went to Goldman Sachs and said, hey, I got this cool life science company, we just got our patent approved, and we want to find somebody to acquire us, you know, Goldman Sachs is a great name. They're probably not going to be the best qualified firm to say, hey, I'm going to take a company that just has a patent and go try to find a buyer. So, you know, I think you want to set your sights on people who are properly experienced. Um, you know, if you're a little later stage, you've taken some money, now you start to build some value where maybe it's going to be attractive. Certainly in my industry, you'll find a lot of investment bankers, sometimes even the bigger firms that will say, wow, that looks pretty sexy hire me and they'll they'll have senior people come in and uh, pitch you on saying, hey, we'd be the right people. Oftentimes when you're a fairly small, you would represent a small client for a big advisory firm, you tend to get shuffled off to a more junior person. So make sure you're clear on who that person is you're going to be working with and that you feel comfortable with that they have the experience, you know, the personality, the style to work with you. Because again, it's 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 not just a transactional relationship. It's having good working chemistry and some of these long-term roles, I think are so critical after 20 years, I, I would walk away from something that looks like a great deal. If I don't think I can work with that person. Uh, and I similarly, I'd probably take on something where I felt good about the person, even if the, the circumstances were less than ideal. Yeah, I think that, I think that's really good advice. And, and you know, I sort of say the same thing to, to entrepreneurs when I meet them, you know, whether they're talking about accounting services or just you know, general mentorship, um, so you need people who um, seem like they have a, a genuine desire to be helpful and to provide you guidance and not just looking for, you know, billable hours type of thing um, and, and have a real familiarity with, with where you are. So if you're going to deal with, you know, your corner lawyer and they're not familiar with venture capital instruments um, or they're not familiar with, tech transfer agreements from the university or collaboration agreements with your CRO or some other parties, then you know it's, it's just not going to represent your best interests. Um, in, in the accounting world, you know, if they're not talking to you about R&D credits and incentive programs and you know things like you know the qualified small business stock exclusions and things like that, then you know they're not putting your, your best interests in mind there. So I mean, yes, anybody can fill out a document, um, whether it's a tax document or a legal document, or give you some general business plan advice. 
but you really want people who understand uh, the life sciences industry, have gone through this before, you know, are familiar with how you're trying to present your company. Um, and, you know, when you start to think about your pitch deck and you have your slide, you know, in you know, slide 12 of your deck there where you have your team, um, you know, it'd be nice to have some advisors on there that are sort of name recognized, especially if you're kind of a first time entrepreneur and, um, you know, having some uh, having some credibility by having some some great names as part of your team is, is really important, I think. So, so let's skip ahead a little bit. Let's just say you did it all right at the beginning, right? You have your corporate structure right. You've done it right with friends and family money and your angel money. You have some VC money and the company's um, looks like it's on the right trajectory. It's growing, um, doing well. How do, when should a person start thinking about selling or exiting, um, um, doing an IPO and which flavor is right for, for a given company? So um, how do I know when it's time to sell and or exit and how do I know what kind of exit, whether it's a merger, an acquisition, um, an IPO? What should I what should I be thinking about? It's a big question, I know. Let's where we where can we get a toehold there? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, let's start with IPO. I, you know, uh, it would be great if somebody who's on this call or somebody affiliated with anyone on this call can get a company from from startup to IPO, public offering. But practically speaking, again, that's like the you know the mega million lottery ticket. I think that for, for the vast majority of companies that get started, can traverse all the challenges of raising capital, building a business, hiring people, all the things you need to, you know, getting acquired is probably the, the most realistic. So I would suggest as a starting point, you think about the end point is getting acquired. One of the things that I found working with companies where the core value is science or technical is the, the challenges. You take. What I've seen multiple times is people tend to get too focus on the science or the technology. You know, I, th I think I can do this or make this happen and you can do that. And what happens is when you start thinking about, hey, should I find somebody to buy it? The business aspect of that gets lost. And by that, I mean, and I've seen this again, out of universities in particular, this, the, the science is great. The intellectual property, getting that is great. But at the end of the day, in order for you to have an exit where people make money, there has to be a business that you can put around it. And I guess I'll give you an example. I assume everyone's generally familiar with the the, the, the phrase clean tech. Uh, so I was involved when clean tech was first used, and that was a general term to describe you know, new technologies, you know, wind, wind turbines and solar and, you know, new forms of uh, chemicals made from plant life instead of petroleum were created and the big challenge the third one I, I can give you I worked with a company out of Denver that had a really cool technology where they were going to make different kinds of acids that had huge markets and coatings and uh, paint and things like that um, to make it from a certain kind of crop that was prevalent where the scientists who founded it came from and it was an alternative that was much healthier and cleaner and abundant than the traditional uh, products which were made from petroleum and they raised about 130 million and had a huge discussion going on with a giant company and they were gonna spend half a billion dollars building a plant when the price of oil was $120 a barrel. And then all of a sudden the price of oil plummeted to about 30 bucks. And guess what, that business was dead because no one was gonna buy those chemicals when they could buy, uh, using some new technology when they could buy the traditional chemicals much cheaper. So a lot of those tech technologies that had great promise scientifically, and we see them in the headlines, wind and solar, as long as traditional means of buying energy are cheaper than the wind and solar, uh, those businesses have no chance unless you get a government subsidy. So again, yeah, I think if you're looking forward to building a business and it's gonna be premised on government subsidy or your price is cheaper than some commodity that exists today or some kind of, pharmaceutical product, whatever it is, there has to be a business case where someone says, if I acquire your company, I can sell this product and make money doing it. And you want to make sure you have a good sense on who's in the market, what's going to differentiate you, but you can't lose sight of the business side of it. And I think for a lot of folks coming in, in life science, from what I've seen, that's the biggest challenge, understanding there's got to be a business on it. So I think when you look at, um, you know, I get to, as part of both my day job and you know, sitting in at the Mid-Atlantic BioAngel 
um, group meetings, we get to see a lot of corporate presentations. So, you know, there's slide decks we get to see all day long, which is, which is, which is great. So I wish I understood the science side of it a little better, but uh, I think it's probably too late in my career to catch that up at this point. So, um, but I think one of the things that we, we do notice through this process here is that um, the, the company has to organize themselves as if they're going to run this company forever. Um, so you have to have an idea of what your sales strategy will ultimately be. Um, you know, is there a market for this? Like how much, you know, is there, is there a profitable market for this? Can somebody make the raw materials that go into this product in such a way that I can, you know, I can fulfill the needs of this? So even if the company is unlikely to um, go into commercialization themselves, it is exceptionally helpful uh, when you're thinking about talking to an investor to say there is a path forward and if we can achieve x then someone will want to buy us because this is a, you know there's a sizable market here it's a profitable market and we've delivered something that they can put into that market um, so you have to think that far that far ahead um, you know when you're dealing with something that's you know on the, on the biotech side of things you know hard to put that into specific words um, and, and numbers in some cases, but I think ultimately that's really important because you know an investor is only going to invest if there's a way out, right? So um, they're not in it to, generally speaking, unless you're dealing with a philanthropic investor, um, you're, they're not in it to see the science advance. They're not in it to see the scientists, you know, produce um, you know papers that are published in, in reputable journals. They're in it to see that the science gets advanced and someone wants to acquire that and therefore I can get my money back. And, you know, investors are looking for good returns. Um, you know, when you look at statistics of venture capitalists and you, you see, you know, venture capital firm X has, you know, returned 30, 50, 70 percent of the money to, uh, to their investors. You know, that all sounds great. Um, it's typically one or two deals that drives that. And everything else is either zero or neutral. So they're looking, you know, it's, it's portfolio theory for the investors. So they're looking for returns. Um, so you have to ultimately think about um, what, what would it take to make a successful business? And that will be that that helps to make you more attractive to a potential um, investor and or purchaser down the road. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I guess, Michelle, to try to give you a little bit more definitive answer to the question you posed um, when. The short answer is you, I, I can never tell you when, but I would suggest you need to think about where you are and what are the steps to get to the point where you have something that can, can generate revenue and make money for the ultimate end user and start trying to map out each of those steps, those risk steps. So you've come up with a technology that can do X, then can I protect it? Can I get a patent on it? Is it a trade secret? Okay, I get that. Then can I can I make a prototype in the in the lab that does what I say it will do? Great, I've done that. Now can I scale this up to a pilot scale uh, at a at a reasonable cost that works? Okay, now I've done that. Now can I scale this from pilot scale to a commercial scale where I can have a billion doses of a vaccine and and make money doing that? Whatever it is, and I again you'll never quite know until you get unless you get really far down the line where you're far enough. But I would I always recommend to companies that are early stage, as soon as you are able to build the dialogue with the ultimate uh, acquirer for your company. You know, if it's a pharmaceutical company, start talking to the pharma guys as early as possible. Not to say, hey, you know, I want you to buy me today. I want you to invest in me. But I, hey, I want you to know, here's what I'm doing. You know, would love to at some point to get some of your attention and talk about, you know, non-confidential things where you might be able to guide me. You know, if, if I could do this, you know, would this solve a problem that you have? Would it, you know, that keeps you up at night? So start building relationships with your ultimate likely acquirers and they can help guide you as to here's what matters to us. If you one day want to call us to buy you, make sure you can check these five boxes. So I would strongly encourage, you know, having those conversations probably earlier than most companies do it. I think that's, uh, I think that's super advice. Um, you know, I think if you can, you know, especially as an early entrepreneur, maybe a first time entrepreneur, you know, you don't have the credibility of two or three exits behind you. Um, if you can start to have that dialogue with, you know, other interested parties, potential investors or strategic partners, 
and you can start to say, here's what I'm going to do and then deliver on those promises, then you start to build that credibility. So I think that's that's a really important part of it. Um, the other thing I would say is, um, and again, this you know, when we listen to the companies come and present at, uh, at uh, MABA, you know, we have a lot of people who are heavy in the science side of things and, and commercialization. And you know, I'm sort of the numbers guy. So to me, if you can't articulate what the steps you need to do to get your product to market and tell me about how long it's going to take and how much it's going to cost, then you don't know what it's going to, then I as an investor could not invest in it, right? So I don't know whether, if this is a, is this going to take $100,000 to to build a better mousetrap and then we can go to market? Okay, I can put my arms around that. You know, if this is a CNS, you know, NCE, and it's going to take, you know, you know, $300 million over 15 years to get to market. That's a totally different thing. You have to be able to articulate, in my mind, you know, what the steps are and roughly how much it's going to cost. So I know whether I'm going to be a large investor, a small investor, and how to participate in that. Um, and then I always think, you know, you should invest or, or take in investment dollars to the extent that you can um, to make sure you have enough money to meet that next milestone, whatever that's going to be. So if you're trying to get through a tox study, make sure you raise enough money to get through that tox study and then be able to go and present and say, listen, I promised you I was going to do this. I did it. We passed. Um, now I'd like to move forward with the next step. So I think that's you know building that credibility and having, uh, I'll say, kind of command and control of the numbers side of the business in terms of what it's going to take to develop that product is, is critical in my mind. We used to say when I worked in venture, we were looking to for enough money to build a bridge, not a pier, right? We want to get to that next milestone. So. Yep. We have a question from the mm -hmm. audience here. Um, could they discuss the strategy of getting consensus for selling the company, assuming investors and founders are on the board? And I'll, I'll throw in a related question about um, what a board maybe could or should look like to facilitate moving toward an exit. So, um, Okay, I guess I, I'll, I'll chime in on that one. So the question is, how do you get to consensus mm -hmm. effectively? That's so. Right, yeah. I'll refer to your co-founders, fellow members of your management team, and uh, investors and board members as something I call stakeholders. So these are people who have a stake in the outcome and have a say in the direction. So I think a lot of that starts on day one. When I talked about earlier, having some of those uncomfortable conversations about equity, make sure you're clear, you know, what, what do we all want to get out of this? You know, what's our endpoint? Um, I've had three partnerships in my career and you know, uh, two of them became clear at some later point that the partners had different views about where where we're going. So I think the lesson learned on that is set that up front as a, um, you know as an early thing. So you have an idea if somebody says, "Hey, I want to take this to public offering," and you're saying, "Hey, I want to get to the point where we could sell it and I could you know get a few bucks in my pocket," that's an issue you want to solve at the beginning. In terms of if you let's assume you've gotten far enough where you've attracted interest from somebody who might have an exit might have an interest in acquiring you that's typically where this question comes up and i don't know that there's a magic bullet to, other than to say you what you have to do is evaluate you and, and the group whoever's going to be an advocate to say hey let's do an exit has to be able to articulate okay guys if we don't do an exit now what's our likelihood if we wait whatever it is one year two years three years presumably you'd only wait to get a bigger number the practical challenge I think people fail to appreciate is you can look around the table at your team and say, okay, guys, I think we can take this from where we are now to this next milestone where our value should go up, but that doesn't take into account all the things that you have no control over in the outside world. And, you know, I was in discussion with a number of folks for, for various uh, exits right before 9-11. And, you know, that was probably the biggest lesson to all of us to realize, you know, forces outside of our control can really change the dynamic. Um, the example I gave where the, the price of a barrel of oil changed significantly. So you ha what you have to understand is, particularly if it's your first exit, you know, be practical. Don't necessarily think, hey, I'm going to uh, I'm going to be on a, you know, Shark Tank as an investor. You know, be be practical and say, okay, guys, what's our goal? You know, if we're all looking to, to validate this, to get our science out there, put it in the hands of somebody who could really take this product to market and, and do good for you know, whatever the original intent was, I think that's an important conversation to know at the front end. 
if once you start taking investors, I think John alluded to, you know, investors can come in with different um, prof classes of stock with different rights. And the minute you start creating different classes of shares, different classes of equity with different rights, you're now really complicating your potential exit. So I think it's just a conversation you need to have at the front end. And then every time you bring in a new stakeholder, make sure that stakeholder sees the world the same way you do. Yeah. So I'll give you, I'll give you an example. I think that, that that point is right on. So so we had a client that was in a um, kind of a fintech type business. Um, they had received probably two million dollars of venture capital and had two venture capitalists on their board. They had a million dollars loan from Silicon Valley Bank and they were doing revenue of about a million dollars. Um, possibility of scaling quite a bit, um, but really at the very early stage of their launch. And I happened to be in San Francisco. Um, my wife was with us. We were having a late dinner there and the CEO from New York called me like three times like at midnight San Francisco time, which is like three in the morning here on the East Coast. And he kept calling me. I said, I better take this call. And it was a deal that was on the table. So unsolicited offer, to purchase their company for cash. And he and the board were having a fight over it. Uh, the board wants to sell. And he's going on and on about, well, we've got the possibility, we've got three proposals outstanding. If we get these proposals, we're gonna be able to do this. Um, we've got a new product that we're hoping to launch in six months. And if that happens, we're gonna do this. He's going on and on. So I said, I said, hold on a second. How much money are you talking about? He says, they wanna close immediately and it's only $100 million. I said, can I give you some advice as, as a friend? I said, take the effing money and pay the effing taxes and be done with it. You and your family will never have to work again in your entire lives. And he's like, that's what the venture capitalists are saying. I think this company is worth like a billion dollars. I said, it might be in a few years if everything goes according to the best case scenario. Um, but what's the risk of it not going to the best case scenario? And are you willing to take that chance um, or do you want the, the bird in the hand? So hard decisions. Um, ultimately, they did wind up selling um, and probably the right decision because I don't think even today they're they're probably only at about five or six million dollars today and not at a hundred million dollars in revenues like he thought they were going to be. So I think he's glad he's got the money and he's retired. <laughs> That's a great illustration. There's a related uh, question from the audience. It says, do investors take an active role in the company? What is the relationship between founders and be just a bit more specific about that? Sorry, you, you fuzzed out a little when you said the relationship between founders and what? Um, the question is, do investors take an active role in the company? And the short answer is sometimes, but we can maybe talk a little bit more about that. And then related, what is the relationship between founders and investors? <laughs> Well, let's so let, I guess I'll take a first shot at that. If, let's assume the investors we're talking about are venture capital firms. So, do they take an let's do they take an active beneficial role? In 20 years, my answer would be hell no. Um, sometimes do they take an active role that's not helpful? Hell yes. I think there tends to be a in my again my experience there's a correlation between the number of investors and the more dysfunction you have at the board. So, my experience has been the concept of a value added investor that's bringing anything other than money, I've never seen it. I, I'm sure it's there and then you could definitely read about cases, but the likelihood of getting that is is pretty low. I think if you get, if you're gonna take, bring in a venture capital investor, just view it as money. And if you get something else beyond that, that's great. But but again, I've, I think I've rarely seen that. And I think, you know, back to what I said at the beginning, once you take outside money, it's not your company. So what's the nature of the relationship between the founders and the investors? If the company's doing great and exceeding every expectation they had at the time you asked them for the money and they put it in, you probably have a great relationship. But if the company hasn't been doing well and you haven't hit the milestones that you said you would hit, um, then it's probably not a great relationship. And when you go back to the investors and say, I'm run out of money, I need more, expect them to want you to share the pain, which typically means they might cut your salary they're certainly going to cut your holdings, your percentage of the company that you own. Um, so the relationship is great if you're doing great, and it's terrible if you're not. It's an overly simplistic way, but 20 years yeah, of data. I, 
I would say it's quite, it's well, quite we'll a build. We'll give you the last word. We got about a minute left. We'll give you the last word on this one. How's that? <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's credibility, right? So you know, you as as the entrepreneur and the founder, um, you have to present a credible story. Um, you have to be forthright and, and honest. You have to give the good news and the bad news. Um, you've got to do your. You know, we talked about you know, kind of stewardship earlier on. So you've got to take care of the money as if it's your own, because it really is. Um, and regardless of how much you know, money um, you've put into this and your effort into it, um, an investor wants to see a return. Um, so everyone's motivated to make the company you know, survive. And if they, they, my experience has been an investor won't intervene unless they feel like they have to intervene. So do your job as, as the entrepreneur, get the help around you that you need to fill out weak spots in your, your management skills. And, and and do things properly and they'll leave you alone. Well, with that, I'm gonna thank you both. Um, we ran through that hour and to my mind, it just flew by. So uh, thank you very much. Um, one final shout out to our our sponsors, um, Suzy Arbaviz, um, MVM Associates and, um, and University Place Associates and, um, and John and Andy especially. So thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.